We've been looking at the complete failure of current cosmology in the last two episodes. The universe the astronomers have been telling us about for decades is so far from being believable, we might ask, how did anyone put forward such a ridiculous story? We need to go back a long way to answer that question. For many centuries, the accepted ideas about the universe came from the thinking of ancient philosophers. They came up with plausible ideas and decided which of their ideas explained how things just had to be. In 1620, Francis Bacon pointed out that doesn't work because man's reason carries the stamp of his own folly. He proposed that the only way to find out how the creation really works is by observation and measurement, the scientific method. When enough measurements have been made, they should be searched to see if there are patterns in the observations and measurements. Then a hypothesis can be put forward to explain those patterns. Critical experiments must then be devised to test the hypothesis. If experiments do not support the hypothesis, we must look for a new one. If much experimental evidence supports and none contradicts, it can be considered a scientific theory. But if any observations contradict a theory or hypothesis, it must be abandoned. The fundamental assumption behind the scientific method is that the creation was created by the creator revealed in the Bible. Bacon assumed that the creation carries the stamp of the creator. The creator of the Bible is an unchanging, law-giving God, so it was natural to assume that the creation would be governed by unchanging laws. Without that assumption, it would have been unreasonable to expect the scientific method to give anything useful, never mind reveal laws of nature. Not surprisingly, it was only in the Christian Reformation and Revival into which Bacon was born, that the scientific method could have been put forward. Only Christians were involved in the birth of Bacon's science, Galileo, Kepler, Newton and many others. But non-Christians saw the great advances that were being made. Bacon's scientific method worked. Newton looked at the universe which consisted of the Earth, Sun, planets and stars, and he considered how this universe could have come into being. Newton argued that the arrangement of the planets and their orbits could not have happened by chance, physical interactions alone. It required the guidance of an intelligent designer. Newton famously stated... This most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. But secular humanists, zealously promoting their enlightenment wisdom, stormed in, even though their worldview could not justify science at all. One very famous French mathematician, Pierre-Simon Laplace, wrote a book about the universe. He was determined to show how the system, which Newton said required a creator, could have happened just by pure chance. Napoleon had a number of mathematician friends, including Laplace. He was very interested in maths. There's even a theorem named after him. Of course, there are naysayers who will tell us Napoleon didn't invent Napoleon's theorem. After all, there are those who say Pythagoras didn't invent Pythagoras' theorem. Napoleon's theorem says, take any 
non-degenerate triangle and construct an equilateral triangle on each of its sides. Take the three centres of those equilateral triangles and join them to construct a final triangle. That triangle will always be equilateral, which seems a little surprising and rather intriguing. It's probably not surprising that Napoleon was very interested in Laplace's work. There's a famous story, probably true, that Napoleon said, Monsieur Laplace, they tell me you have written this large book on the system of the universe and have never even mentioned its creator. Laplace replied, I have no need of that hypothesis. His hypothesis is usually called the nebula hypothesis, which can be translated roughly as the fuzzy idea. It explains how a spinning cloud of gas and dust cooled and contracted, making it spin faster and faster. The dust would be flung away from the centre and form rings that eventually coalesced to form planets. The material which remained at the centre would coalesce to become the Sun. So Newton was wrong. It didn't need a creator at all. Laplace's hypothesis was treated with the greatest respect. But there were very serious Christians who were not convinced. James Clark Maxwell, who we've met in several episodes, is generally considered the greatest theoretical physicist of the 1800s. Maxwell showed that if Laplace's rings were solid, then they would break into pieces and collapse. If they were liquid, the differential rotation, with different parts of the ring rotating at different speeds, would create shear forces which would prevent the rings from coalescing into a planet. He showed that the only stable arrangement for rings, like those of Saturn, must be individual particles orbiting independently. Our Enlightenment humanists tried for a long time to get the nebula hypothesis to work, but their attempts seem to have fizzled out and Newton seems to have been proved correct. Things could not be as we find them without the input of an intelligent creator. And that may remind us of the famous atheist, Fred Hoyle, who came to the conclusion, the creation of the universe requires an intelligence. Hoyle was crushed, cancelled, robbed of his Nobel Prize and thrown out for daring to say so. But the Enlightenment humanists have not given up. They're still trying to explain the universe without the need for a creator. One of the most determined efforts today involves string theory. A few years ago, something like half of the papers being published in theoretical physics were on string theory. That was the situation year after year, and someone asked, why are there no Nobel Prizes for string theory? The Nobel Prize Committee answered, We have not found any evidence that strings exist. Nobel Prizes are supposed to be for science. Genuine science is based on observation and measurements. Strings have never been observed or measured. So how is it possible that today's scientific establishment accepts string theory as having anything to do with science? It's just another fuzzy idea. Maxwell is not only famous for proving that Laplace's nebula hypothesis was wrong, he worked on an amazing number of problems in science. In his work on the nature of light, he devised the process for making colour photographs and succeeded in making the very first one. 
Maxwell also came up against the theory of evolution. Evolution used to be the answer to everything. As Julian Huxley put it, evolution, in the extended sense, can be defined as a directional and essentially irreversible process occurring in time which in its course gives rise to an increase of variety and an increasingly high level of organisation in its products. Our present knowledge indeed forces us to the view that the whole of reality is evolution, a single process of transformation. Armed with the knowledge of the nature of atoms and molecules, and with the second law of thermodynamics, Maxwell was able to refute the earlier stages of the evolution theory, including the origin of life, leaving the later stages with nothing to stand on. Seems like evolution is just another fuzzy idea. So Maxwell effectively demolished the foundations of the Enlightenment's worldview. But today, most evolutionists tell us that the origin of life has nothing to do with evolution. Origin of life is now called abiogenesis, and that's a different matter entirely. It seems as if nothing will shake their confidence in their creator-free speculations. To make this possible, they scrapped the scientific method and brought in the best in the field ruling. An accepted theory cannot be rejected until the Enlightenment scientific establishment has accepted an alternative which fits their worldview. So, as we've seen in recent episodes, for a hundred years astronomy has been based on a supposition even weaker than the nebula hypothesis, an explosion of nothing into everything. And now the observations and measurements are able to test the theory's predictions and show that they are directly, drastically wrong. Can we expect that the scientific establishment is going to admit the obvious? What Newton pointed out more than two centuries ago? The creation of the universe required input from an intelligent creator. Or even what atheist Fred Hoyle pointed out much more recently. The creation of the universe, like the solution of the Rubik Cube, requires an intelligence. Well, I suppose we can hope. But you never know. We might find the astronomers telling us that the origin of the universe has nothing to do with astronomy. That's a totally independent field called a stellar genesis. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.